up in uh, Michigan and uh, attended Michigan State University where she earned a bachelor's of science degree in biochemistry and a doctorate in biophysics. She then spent 19 years in pharmaceutical research for Upjohn Pharmaceuticals, giving her an insider knowledge of the effect of government regulation on the drug industry. Leaving her position with Upjohn in 1995, Dr. Ruar chose to focus her career on communication and ethics, which has continued to be a recurring theme in her professional and political endeavors. She developed a course on communication for scientists that has been met with wide acclaim and was crucial in the development of a course on medical research ethics for the University of North Carolina. About this time, she also began exploring social ethics and published the first edition of her book, Healing Our World in 1992. Uh, and there's a brand new uh, edition out right now. And it contrasts the ethical ideals of libertarian principles with many of the ethically void public policies in place today. In an effort to help libertarians communicate more effectively with those outside of the country, she has also published Short Answers to Tough Questions, which is based on questions posed for being here. Uh, one of the advantages of a small group is you have me all to yourself. You can ask me any questions you want. But first, I'm going to just do a quick overview of libertarianism and some of the things that I think even some of the people who have been in the party for a long time may not be aware of. I'll bring you up to speed, and then I'll open the floor to questions. And I will deal with the abortion issue. Uh, I've been asked specifically about that. I'll do that at the end because some of the things I'm going to say in the beginning bear on that question. So let's get started. Um, and let me see if our slides work. As you know, the title of my talk is Am I a Libertarian? And to decide that, you have to see how you feel about the non-aggression principle because that's what libertarians are all about. We affectionately call it the NAP. And basically, it's very similar to what we learned as children. Don't threaten, first strike, force, fraud, or theft. And if you want to live a more positive life, then you could say, honor our neighbor's choice. And that's the way I would like to say it, honoring our neighbor's choice. And this is part of what we call the pledge in the National Party. If we believe this and are willing to accept this, then you know, we consider ourselves to be libertarians. But what I'm showing you is actually only the first part of the non-aggression principle. If you don't understand the second part or the important corollary, it will be hard to apply this first one. And that second part is if we violate the non-aggression principle, we may <laughs> right again through restitution. This is, again, very similar to what we learned as children. If we were out in the street playing ball and the ball went through our neighbor's window, what did we have to do? We had to replace it, right? If we took our playmate's toy and destroyed it, we had to replace it out of our allowance or do some lawn cutting or something to make up for it so we could get that money. And so if you understand the principle of restitution, then you can really understand how a lot of the libertarian philosophy works. Now, for example, some people who don't understand this idea of restitution say things like, Oh, well, you libertarians aren't true to your principles. You would violate the uh, non-aggression principle if your child's life was at stake. You know, for example, if you're out hiking and your child has an accident and you need to get them to the hospital right away and you see this car by this cabin and there's no one in the cabin, you'll steal the car. You'll violate the non-aggression principle. Well, <clears throat> that's because they don't understand the difference between Democrats, Republicans, and Libertarians. Now, the Democrats and Republicans would say, oh, we need the car, therefore it's okay for us to take it, and too bad for the other person. Libertarians would say, this is a life-threatening situation. 
I probably will violate the non-aggression principle and take this car, but I'm going to expect that afterwards I'm going to have to pay restitution. And I don't know what it is now, because maybe the other person will say, hey, I'm glad my car was there to help wash it, put gas in it, and I'm happy. But if that person had an accident while you took the car, and then he couldn't get his wife to the hospital and she died, that's a whole different situation, isn't it? So it's, it's, very, it's very tough to know when you violate the non-aggression principle, really what your restitution is going to be sometimes. But as a libertarian, we know there's going to be restitution involved. And that's, that's the difference because Democrats and Republicans uh, feel like they can violate other people's property rights, take their stuff, and not have to pay it back in any way. Libertarians know the world doesn't work that way. It creates resentment but we balance the scales by making it right again and paying that restitution. And that's why Republicans and Democrats support a lot of things that libertarians call victimless crimes, because they themselves are the aggressors. The libertarians are gonna do that. And we can talk more about that a little later on. Now, you might say, well, well restitution's after the fact. You know, we wanna prevent crime. We don't wanna fix it after the fact. But restitution is the best deterrent known. How does that work? Well, one of the ways that it works, uh, you can see in Japan, which is the only industrialized country that has had decreasing crime since World War II, pretty consistently. And the reason is they have a system of restitution in place. So if I come into your house and I steal something from you, and I get caught, which I probably will, at least in the Japanese society. And we'll, again, you can ask me questions in the Q&A about, about why that doesn't happen here. What would happen is someone from my family or some representative of mine would come to you and say, okay, Mary knows she did wrong. She took your stuff. She's gonna return it. She's gonna pay you for all your time and trouble. You know, what is it gonna take to restore you? What is it gonna take to make full restitution? And a negotiation happens. After that negotiation is complete or stalled, then we go before the judge. And if you like the settlement, if you say, yeah, I'm, I'm made whole again, you say that to the judge. And the judge says, okay, Mary, we'll just, we'll just give you a hand slap here. We won't give you a big sentence. But if the judge finds out that I haven't been negotiating in good faith, then he's gonna give me a pretty harsh sentence. And of course, if you're not negotiating in good faith, then he may just make a settlement for you. So that's how it works in Japan. And the beauty of this is that before someone create, uh, before someone commits a big crime, they commit a little crime first. And if they get caught committing a little crime, and they have to restore the victim, they find out pretty quickly that crime doesn't pay. That doesn't happen over here. If somebody steals, they barely get hand slapped. They, they probably won't get prison until the second or third time, unless it's a rare case. So people learn that crime does pay here, as opposed to Japan. Now, I've referenced chapter 13 of my book, Healing Our World, if you want more details, because I only have an hour with you, and I can talk on just this subject for that length of time. And if you go to my website, you can actually access the 1993 version of Healing Our World for free if you want the updated 2015 version with the foreword by Ron Paul, with a great heart on the cover, uh, the globe heart, then you can buy one after this talk or you can buy it at my website. But the free edition is there for you if for some reason you don't feel comfortable buying the book. And of course the new one obviously is more complete. I'll talk about that a little bit at the end of my talk. Okay, so now that we kind of know the basics of what the non-aggression principle is and what, the, what happens if we violate it. Let's talk about what happens in society. Okay, so let's say that I go to your house, I point a gun at your head, and I say, give me your money. Am I stealing from you? Anybody think I'm not stealing? If you do, raise your hand. Okay, so we kind of all agree on that, it's pretty simple. Okay, so now what if instead of going by myself and risking, you know, having you beat me up as I try to take your money, I decide to get the majority of my neighbors and we go to your house and say, give us your money or we'll shoot you. 
Are we stealing from you? Let's see a show of hands of people who think we are not stealing. Okay, everyone agrees. Okay, now what happens if instead of taking the majority of the neighbors with me, the majority of the neighbors get together and we hire a thug to come and do the same thing, point a gun at you and say, give us your money. Are we still stealing from you? How many people think we aren't? And if we hire a thug and call that thug government, are we still stealing from you? If we call the money that we take taxes, are we still stealing from you? It's pretty much the same action, but by calling it by a different name, we sometimes kind of think that it's not the same thing. And the reaction I usually get when I ask that is, oh, but how do we pay for the government services? As if that somehow changes the nature of the act. Well, and the answer to that question is most of these services were provided privately long before they were ever provided by government. And the nice thing about private service is that it's usually about half the price of the government price. And, and during the Q&A, if you have something specific that you just can't conceive of being supplied by the private sector, please feel free to ask. So, if we all agree that taxation is theft, or looks pretty close to theft, then we know that the non-aggression principle is violated in our society. This is what we learned as children, how to get along with our friends. So is it any wonder that we have a world of poverty and strife when we have so much aggression in our world? Probably not. Now, when people first hear about this idea of taxation, they often say, huh, well, libertarianism doesn't seem very practical to me because I really can't see how all these services could be provided by the private sector. But in fact, liberty is extremely practical. Um, let me ask you this. Do you want to live in a world of widespread starvation, environmental destruction, animosity, sickness, death, misery? Is that the kind of society you want to live in? Probably not. And I can assure you that Nancy Neal wouldn't be in the libertarian movement for 30 years, and I certainly wouldn't, I've been in, I think about that long, certainly wouldn't be in it if that's what the result was. The result of honoring the non-aggression principle is widespread harmony and abundance. Just like it was in your neighborhood when you were children. Because if nobody hit first, there could be no fight, right? If no one stole each other's toys, generally things were peaceful. And if no one stole toys and broke them, then the toys were always there, right? It was a very rich environment, for children at least. And what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about how the libertarian philosophy of non-aggression creates a world that is just the opposite of the one I have up here. Because that's very important. People want practical results. And the ethical and the practical are two sides of the same coin. They aren't separate. Because what we consider ethical or moral is what it takes humankind to survive and thrive. That's how we derive our morals and ethics. So let's take an example. Basically, what this graph shows, I know graphs can sometimes look pretty intimidating, but let me just walk you through it. It's actually pretty simple. On the left-hand side, you see the total number of federal regulators, and on the lower axis, you see that we're looking from 1980 to the early 1990s. And that dark line that starts up at the top are the number of regulators that were in place in 1980. Notice that they drop during the Reagan years because he actually laid off a lot of regulators. And then towards the end of the 80s, early 90s, these regulators were hired back in and the number of regulators went up. Now on the other side of the graph is the number of um, private sector jobs, private sector job growth. And that's that light colored line. Now notice when there were a lot of regulators, there were very few private sector jobs. And yet, when regulators went down, the jobs went up, and vice versa. Each regulator killed about 150 jobs. 
Why is this important? It's important because poverty is caused not by disability usually. It's usually caused because people can't get and keep a job. And in an economy where the regulators are killing the jobs, no jobs are to be had, you have more poverty. So this is why it's important to rein in government regulators. The jobs that are destroyed are those of small businesses because when there's a new regulation in place, the small businesses can't cope with it. The bigger businesses can. The mom and pop places go out of business and they, they really create about 80% of the jobs. So one of the things libertarians want to do is decrease regulation. How does this relate to the non-aggression principle? Well, think about what a regulation is. <clears throat> it says that you can't sell something to me unless you jump through some hoops that are supposed to be for consumer protection, but usually are for protection of your competitors. If you think of all the trials and tribulations Uber went through, because there were taxi cab licenses, and the taxi cab licensed people didn't want Uber around. In, in uh, New York, for example, it cost about a million dollars to get a medallion to drive a taxi. What poor person can afford a million dollars? Nobody, right? So they all had to be employees and still, instead of self-employed. So regulations can really be very, um, very job-killing. And we can talk about ones you think might be important for consumer protection a little later, if you'd like in the Q&A. Now, I want to point out that for most of humanity's um, existence on the world, we were very poor. If you look at this graph, what it does is it shows you the amount of wealth creation represented by the GNP per capita for the years 1750 through 1977. But actually, if I extended this graph out to the beginning of humanity, that low number, $1,000 a year, which is what most people lived on for most of our human history, would be the same. Everybody was poor. Something happened in the, in the 19, uh, I'm sorry, the 1780s, the Industrial <laughs> Revolution. And that was only made possible, I think because of the American Revolution, which gave a lot of property rights in a, in a new way, a lot of liberty that never had been seen in the world before or in a, in, a, in a big way. And Britain rolled back its regulations and its taxes, and so it joined the revolution too. And so the developed countries, as you see in, in the upper line, increased their per capita wealth creation, while the third world, shown on the bottom line, remained about the same. Why did the third world remain the same? Because it had, it, it didn't reform, it still had government that was very much like the attitude of the Democrats and Republicans, which is, uh, forget the non-aggression principle, we're gonna take what we want, we're gonna tax and regulate as we want. So bigger government means less wealth creation. We can see that here as well. On this graph, what we see on the bottom is the total government spending at a, a percentage of the GDP. And in the top, in the um, axis, you see the average annual growth of real GDP. Basically, what this means is the more government spends, the less wealth we create. And it doesn't matter what government spends it on as much as the fact that government's spending it because government is an inefficient spender. It doesn't have profit and loss to tell it what works and what doesn't. The good news, this can change very quickly. There were three countries, Ireland, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom, that decided they would change from a high spending, uh, high uh, government percentage spending to a low spending, and you can see how much their wealth creation jumped. It more than doubled in a very short time, in a matter of a few years, a handful of years. So it's very possible to change the way we do things. It's possible to make a wealthier world. And the good news is the poor benefit the most. If you look at the difference between the most free countries and the least free countries, you see that the uh, lowest income people in the most 
three countries have the most money. They have the most buying power. They're not as poor as people in other countries. That's why you'd rather be a poor person in the US than in India, for example. So freedom or liberty, which is the practice of the non-aggression principle. That's what political liberty is, the non-aggression principle. Translates into better wealth, more wealth, um, and especially for the poor. The poor benefit most by liberty, not the rich. The rich don't need liberty because they have money they can buy their way out of regulations, for example. So that's why the Libertarian Party should be the party of the disadvantaged. Unfortunately, what I've just shown you, we have not gotten this message out, and we need to, because if you think about it, if we really want votes, who's got the most votes, the poor or the rich? There's more poor people, right? So that's a message we need to get out. And it's not just about money. Uh, when we have more wealth, we have greater life expectancy. In other words, liberty not only makes us wealthy, it makes us healthy. And that's good news. Now, many times libertarians are told that, ah, eh, you know, not only do you not care about the poor, which as you can see from this isn't true, uh, liberty is really about the poor. The poor benefit most by liberty. And they say libertarians don't care about the environment. But in fact, the environment is most protected by liberty. A libertarian society would end what we call sovereign immunity. Most environmentalists aren't aware of this, but the biggest polluter is the government, specifically in the world, the US military. And we can go into some details on that if you want in the Q&A. Sovereign immunity means that the government is exempt from restitution. Utah courts found that the uh, government had tested the atom bomb in Utah in a way that was reckless and created cancer among the population. But the court also said to the victims, hey, too bad, the government's got sovereign immunity. You don't get any restitution. So libertarians would not, would not believe in that, would not take that. And of course, if you think about it, if corporate managers were, had to, had, to, had to be liable for the full restitution when they did some environmental damage, they wouldn't want to do it because it's much harder to clean up your garbage than dump it in the first place. And of course, they wouldn't want to work for companies without liability insurance because they wouldn't want to spend the rest of their life making things right again if they made a mistake. So insurers would insure companies and managers based on what their practices were. This would be good because sometimes a lot of the practices that the EPA wants to put in effect are actually pretty outdated. They kind of keep on the same uh, old technology instead of moving forward with the new. Insurers, of course, would be smarter about that. They would have financial incentive to do that. And privatizing land and beast <laughs> saves the environment too. In Zimbabwe, elephants can be hunted uh, for and, and those in Zimbabwe, the number of elephants have quadrupled since this was put into practice in the, I think it was in the late 70s, early 80s. However, in neighboring Kenya, where they outlaw any property rights in elephants, the natives turn the other way when the elephants are poached because there's no benefit for them to have the elephants. In fact, the elephants are a detriment. They trample their crops. And so what's happened there in Kenya is they've lost 75% of their herds. <coughs> so the environment can be protected by using these libertarian principles. And I could go into a big thing on diffusing terrorism. Let me just say that most of the people that we go after, Osama bin Laden, Saddam Hussein, ISIS even, we've funded them. We've created them with our foreign aid. In a libertarian society, that foreign aid would not be, uh, would not be taken as taxes from the citizens and given to dictators to grow them. 
So we would not have some of the problems that we have today. And we did have a lot of warning about 9-11. The FBI got an indication that there were Middle Eastern men trying to learn how to fly planes but not land, um, not take off. And they didn't follow up on them because they were too busy going after peaceful pot smokers. And there were some visa immigrations in the 9-11 hijackers too that weren't followed up on uh, because our immigration was too busy going after peaceful produce pickers from Mexico. Uh, we have had embargoes on Iraq, which created a lot of animosity. It didn't hurt Saddam Hussein to hurt the poor who couldn't get their medicine and food. And of course, our military installations are all over the world, and the military installations are the biggest polluters. They dump jet fuel and other types of toxic waste into the environment in these countries, and some, even some of our allies don't want us there anymore because of that. You know, we could bring the troops home, so if we did get attacked, they were there to protect us instead of overseas. And civilians actually reported these things uh, to the FBI about the, uh, uh, about the terrorists wanting, or the Middle Eastern men wanting to learn how to fly planes without landing or taking off. We could train our civilians to pay attention to things like this, and civilians were very eager to do that after 9-11, but we didn't encourage that. And of course, we could encourage concealed carry as well because terrorists like to attack those who aren't armed. <laughs> if we were able to defend ourselves, if pilots even had had guns on the 9-11 planes, those hijackings might never have been able to occur. So these are some of the things that libertarians talk about. And all everything I've said relates back to the non-aggression principle. If that's not obvious to you, then you know, be sure and ask me during the Q&A, because that's what I'm here for, to help you make that connection. And I'll just kind of like to end by saying, a libertarian world, to sum it up, would be about three to eight times wealthier than our world today. I don't think you can even imagine a world that wealthy. I certainly can. I mean, that would mean a cure for cancer, AIDS, we'd probably be going to other planets, we'd live a lot longer. Just think about how your life would be enhanced if your paycheck was tripled. If you had buying power that was tripled. That's incredible, right? Jobs would be available for virtually everyone. Poverty as we know it today wouldn't exist. Uh, and of course, we'd have less crime, a better environment and less terrorism. But that may not be totally obvious from everything I've said. I want to uh, I want to answer your questions. Before I do, I just want to let you know that the books that Nancy Neal mentioned are available here today. There's a, oops, we'll go back. There is a, there is a booth that is selling them, the Liberty Tees, which is on the back wall, or not the back wall, the, as you enter the exhibit hall, it's on the left, and I have some copies here which I'll sell in the back of the room at the end if anyone's interested. Uh, you can also get these at my website, and uh, I wanted to share with you, again, that much of this material is also available on my website at ruart.com. Uh, part of it, um, obviously, part of it is not available except in these books, but if you want to get started and kind of get a feel for the way I write and what you can get, you can start the website. Now, the one thing I do want to say about healing, it's the most comprehensive compilation of how liberty works and the toughest testing ground of all, the real world. There are 1,300 references of studies that have been done, and you've seen a few of the data points today. But the book is easy to read, I try, I try to make it very user friendly and of course you can always email me through my website if you have further questions after this talk i'm going to stop at this point so we have plenty of time for q a ah, but i do i did promise i'm sorry I, I have one more thing to cover i did promise a couple of the women i would talk about abortion let me do that you know libertarians like other parties are kind of split on how you think about that. If you're a libertarian, you don't want to aggress against the, 
unborn, you don't want to kill it. So you may think it's murder, and you might be both pro-life. On the other hand, since at least for the first few months of its life, the fetus is part of the mother and can't be separated from the mother without dying, it's part of her body. And if she is forced to carry that child to term, then she's being forced to use her, you know, use her life blood quite literally to support a life that she might not want. And does uh, giving life, does it give you the obligation to keep, keep it up? And if it does, does that end the birth? Or do you have an obligation to keep on and on and on? You see how this gets kind of tangled. I believe that a libertarian society would make abortion obsolete. Why? It would be wealthy enough to have the medical technology to transfer an unwanted fetus to a willing really mother or to an in vitro, uh, or what we call it, uh, you know, uh, an artificial uterus, so that you wouldn't have to have the option of abortion which kills the unborn. And only a libertarian society is likely to get you this because only a libertarian society is wealthy enough to have that technology at this point in time. And I truly believe if the pro-life and the pro-choice forces got together and took the money and instead of lobbying against each other, which is going to continue on because you're not going to resolve this problem. I really don't think it's something that's going to be resolved by debate. Took their money and put it into this medical technology, I think it would not be long before abortion could be obsolete. So that is what I would propose to do to deal with the abortion problem because it's, I, I, I just don't think that's ever going to end that back and forth. Okay, now I will open it up for questions and uh, feel free to ask me anything. Yes? So if in a libertarian society the government uh, wasn't able to see what happened to the and also try to force, how would the government be able to function if it's not funding taxes? How would it be able to even exist? Not necessarily provide services, but CSA. Well, I mean if you if I mean what what service would you want it to do that you would need it to exist for? So that's, I, I want to answer that on a couple different levels because it's an excellent question. Because part of that question is, does the non-aggression principle imply no government? Or does it imply a limited government? And again, libertarians are split on this. Um, I think ultimately, all services that the government provides would be private. So I don't think there's a need for what we call government today. Because government today, as we know it today, is basically there to do something that we're not allowed to do as private citizens. It is there to initiate force, to violate the non-aggression principle. And that's why I ask you what service you were thinking of. Because if you stop and think for a little bit about what it is you want this government to do, and, and let's say, for example, you said, I, I really want the government to run the court system then the court system and the police system, if it were run by government or by the private sector really, would actually be paid for by the criminals because part of their restitution would be paying for the cost of their apprehension and for their trial. So hopefully you wouldn't need to tax to keep a government going at all. The services all can be privatized. Now whether you have government as the only um, the only agency that actually does the apprehending and the trying, that's another question. Uh, actually, there's been a lot of studies on that too, and privatizing those services works pretty well. 
Uh, cities that have had private police generally see their crime drop about 80% in the first few years. That's huge, and the reason is, it is very inefficient to try to capture a criminal. What's more efficient is to prevent them from being a criminal in the first place. So what the private police force does is it tries to prevent crime by setting things up so that houses, vacant houses, for example, are not attractive targets. And, and so that's why the private police are able to lower crime, and of course, that means you pay less for them too because they're operating more efficiently. Hope that helped out a little bit. And I'll be out, I'll be, I'll be here afterwards too if I haven't answered some of these questions fully. Okay, any more? Yes. You talked about uh, a woman being forced to carry a couch with her. Um, where is that force coming from if she is the mob aggressor? If it if okay. she was doing this to I'm sorry, where did the force come from? I mean who who is forcing her to do this if okay. she participated in, you know, nine nine percent of the time a consensual act that led to the sure. Ah, ah, where does the force come from? Okay, so let's say I'm pregnant and I want an abortion. What's happening is that it's against the law, if it's against the law for me to have an abortion, then my doctor and I will be stopped, at gunpoint if necessary, from doing that abortion. If it's against the law, how is the law enforced? Right, but I think what she's trying to say is... Is, the, is a fetus an aggressor? Oh no, the child's not an aggressor. Okay, no. If the child's not an aggressor, then how do you justify an initiation of forcing? Ah, okay, that's a very good question. Thank you. Um, so the child is not an aggressor, but it's kind of like uh, a trespasser in your house. Let's say, well, I mean, okay, you can. Let's say you've invited somebody over to your house, and you're having a good time, and everything's cool, and you say, okay. Now it's time for you to leave because, you know, I've got to go to bed or go to work the next day or whatever. And the person says, no, nah, I'm going to stay here and live. Well, if the option is they're going to walk in the front yard and get shot, like they're going to be dead if they leave the house. But also, oh, oh, well, no, no. Well, I mean, just this is just, yes, yes. And, and that's a good point. Well, here's what I, this is my, now, again, remember, libertarians differ on this, so I'm going to give you my take, okay? So I would say that until, once the fetus can live outside the mother, then basically you can't go in and have an abortion and kill it because then you know you are in a position where you use the least amount of force always, even if you're defending yourself. Let me go, let me do a defense thing and then you kind of get the abortion thing a little easier. So let's say I come into your house and I'm gonna steal from you or I point a gun at you. I point a gun at you and you think I'm gonna shoot you, so you wanna stop me. So you take your gun and you shoot me in the leg and I go down, my gun goes flying, I'm no longer a danger to you. You have used the appropriate amount of force to stop me. But now if you take your baseball bat and start beating on me, now, you know, I'm not doing anything anymore. You're just kind of taking revenge on me, right? So it's, you're now the aggressor against me because you're pounding on me when I'm not a threat. Similarly, when you're aborting, if you don't need to kill the fetus, and you do, then you're using excessive force and you're becoming an aggressor. So I think that's, so, I know it's a little complex. Why do you need to kill the fetus? I mean, even Ron Paul said as an OBJ, he'd never seen a case in 35 years where a woman needed to have an abortion to live. Oh, oh, but you, no, but, but technology is getting so much better now. I mean, now, you know, I think about four or five months, they can actually keep the child alive. So if you were carrying a child, and that's part of why the law usually says three months, because they feel that after that, the, the child can be maybe safe. So if you were in that range, you would have trouble getting an abortion. Now there are libertarians who believe you can have a, an abortion uh, that will kill the child up till it's born. I don't believe that. I think once the child can live outside the mother, least amount of force would be an induced labor. And, and least amount of force is an important thing to think about. Now, again, now remember, there are pro-life libertarians. If you, were you at the presidential debate last night? Okay. Um, Austin Peterson was, he's a pro-life candidate and he's talking about, you know, again, it feels like you do, that, uh, you know, the, the 
The child hasn't aggressed, and yet you're killing them. And, and you know, a lot of libertarians feel that way. So, you know, that's not a problem. Like, like every other party, there's the back and forth going on. That's why I say that the resolution is not, I don't think the resolution is going to come from discussion, because I don't think there's going to be agreement. I think the resolution is going to come when abortion is obsolete. Doctors will refuse to abort if they can save the life of the child. So, and, and not to go I agree, I'm probably not going to agree on this issue, but for the Libertarian Party, would it be convenient and to not take a stand on this issue? Do you have some of you for life Libertarian? Well, we do. Actually, we say, in the, if our platform says that people of good conscience can go either way on this, we just don't think the government should get involved. Actually, the platform says that the party is for choice. Uh, no, we've got, we've got it. We've actually got it in our packet. We've got it in our packet. Is it whole Texas party? No, the National Party. Pull out your packet. That's in there on the platform. Uh, oh wait, I, actually, I take that back. It's not in your packet. I have it. Hang on, okay. I'll read it. <laughs> I'll bring it up for discussion. Yeah, I'll tell you what. Actually, um, what's called the fair tax today uh, was started by a libertarian who thought that that would be a good way to show everybody how bad taxes were, because you'd be paying it every time you bought something. And you know, as the tax rate went up, you'd really get upset, and that would be better than withholding. I personally don't agree with that, but again, there are many libertarians that do, and I don't have any qualms with people who want to try to tweak the system and make it better in the interim. But ultimately, I don't think that's going to work because I think what's going to happen is you're still going to have a problem. I mean, I think, so I, I'm, I'm kind of trying to look at the big picture and where we want to end up. And yes, steps like, uh, for example, school choice is another uh, partial option. That's not something I work on, but I certainly don't object either. There are times, you know, you gotta, got to make use of what's right at the time. And that's a judgment we all have to make. Probably the best interim, probably the best interim plan that I know is cutting back on taxes, cutting back on spending. And there's good reasons to cut back on government spending, as I showed you. <laughs> it increases our wealth. Okay, other questions? Yes. I guess my, my question is about uh, like the way that we go about enacting these libertarian policies, mm -hmm. um, and I guess why why we should uh, support the Libertarian Party instead of supporting uh, candidates like the Pauls in like more mainstream parties. Okay, why should you vote Libertarian instead of mainstream? Well, instead of like like someone like Ron Paul who's in a mainstream. Oh, okay, somebody like Ron Paul. Well, I mean, Ron Paul is definitely a much better option, but of course, you saw what they did to him in 2012. They said, okay, if you, if you win five primaries, you can be nominated for our GOP nomination, and then at the last minute, they changed the rules to nine. After all the primaries were over, and there was no chance to get it. This is how the other parties operate. They don't operate fairly. And although I would be thrilled to see Ron Paul get the GOP nomination, frankly, I don't think it's going to happen. And it's not gonna happen because they cheat. <laughs> and that's because that's who they are. If, if they practice fairness, 
If they practiced the non-aggression principle, we wouldn't have the problems that we have today. They don't. And if you, there's a good movie, um, I'm trying to remember the name, The Distinguished Gentleman. Have you seen that movie? It's an old movie. Check it out. It kind of answers your question in a fun way. Just to clarify, um, mm -hmm. is it trying to change like, the Republican Party or the Democratic Party, maybe, to like, be more fair and accommodate? That's a lot oh, of okay, okay. Now that's well, a different question. Trying to change it, change it from within. You think change that, it from within. That's, okay. That's a lot of cause. They're trying to change the. Is, okay, is, yeah, is changing the party from the inside a lost cause? In a way it's not, because even if you don't change the party, you'll win a lot of minds and hearts in the process, and that's what's important. Um, is it going to be any easier than what we're doing? Probably not, because they're so entrenched. But quite honestly, I don't think it's going to happen through the electoral system. The reason to vote libertarian is we spend 95% of our resources getting on the ballot. Because what happens is the Democrats and Republicans have made it very difficult for us to be on the ballot unless we pay a lot of money or get a lot of signatures every year, almost. Or we have to get a high percentage of the vote total. So they've already rigged the system so that it's very, very hard for us to even get on the ballot, let alone win. That's not how we're gonna change things, in my opinion. I think by changing hearts and minds of the general populace, that's what will change everything because then people will demand candidates at every party that follow the non-aggression principle if that's what they adopt. People will demand candidates who are promoting their liberty if that's what they want. And right now, people think liberty does the opposite of what it does. In the uh, early 20th century, the, we moved away from liberty when we were told that freedom was a good thing, but it didn't help the poor, save the environment, and do all those wonderful things that we know it does. But back then, we didn't have the data to share with them. And you know, saying it didn't quite, quite work because they had manipulated the system and created a Great Depression make people think that the marketplace had failed when in fact the government had failed. So when people wake up to this, then I think we will have no problem changing the world. But until a significant number, 5% is all we need. According to uh, the research, it's done, about 5% of the population with strong conviction can change society. And we're not all that far from that. So that's where I see the hope. And another thing, liberty benefits just about everybody. Now, people are very motivated for their own self-happiness, right? <laughs> so if they see that they benefit by liberty, they're gonna want it. So our job as libertarians is to help them see that in fact, they benefit from it. And we have the data now to back it up. We didn't have that when I started, when Nancy Neal started. We have it now. So I have a lot of hope. Nancy, what's our timing like? Am I? Um, I think we're. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay.
Well, that's a good question. Should we fix the welfare state before we open the borders? And the answer is studies show that most of the people that come and immigrate to the United States actually are young people who want to work and do work and actually pay quite a bit of taxes uh, that outweigh the ones who go on assistance. And I can, I can point you to those studies if you like. So, so in other words, the net effect of immigration is not a drain on the welfare state per se. It's, it's actually a net positive. But, but even if it were, let me just say, even if it were the opposite way, think about it. If you say we need to fix, we need to, we need to fix this part and get liberty here before we can get liberty there, it's like encouraging them. <laughs> in other words, where our effort should be should not be in stopping immigration, <clears throat> it should be in stopping the welfare state. We put as much attention to stopping the welfare state as we do to stopping immigration, we wouldn't have a welfare state. Yeah. So that's where our effort should be. Because otherwise, we are setting ourselves up to give up another liberty instead of acquiring, another, you know, acquiring more liberty. I would definitely love to see those. Things. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to. They're, they're cited in Healing Our World. That's, you know, but I can also uh, take out some other ones that are newer. <laughs> if you have questions after this, be sure and email me. You can go through my website at uart.com. And uh, I've also put up uh, ISIL.org because um, I am chair of the International Society for Individual Liberty, which is changing its name <coughs> because of its unfortunate acronym <laughs> to Libertarian International. And uh, I should give credit because uh, Libertarian International co-published Healing Our World with me this time. So I really like it if you could go to their website and sign up for the newsletters and things because You'll learn about the international movement, and you'll learn all the things that are different there. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty eye-opening. So don't hesitate to do that. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>